All right. So this summer I was hired by Project Puffin as a research assistant and I was working and living on a seabird island or a seabird colony. And we'll dive a little bit deeper into that. So what exactly is Project Puffin? So in 1973, uh, National Audubon Society and found, founding member, um, Dr. Stephen Kress, he had a kind of a crazy idea to put a lot of effort into restoring the puffins to their historical nesting sites in the Gulf of Maine. Um, so in the colonial days, the puffins and all the seabirds in the Gulf of Maine were pretty much hunted um, for their meat, their eggs, and their plumage. So um, there was a huge decline. Um, there was only a, a couple islands left with puffins on them. And so Dr. Stephen Kress um, had the idea of taking some chicks from Newfoundland. They had a healthy population of Atlantic puffins there and translocate them to Eastern Egg Rock, which is an island off the coast of Maine. And uh, he would rear them on his own. He would put them in these artificial burrows and um, pretty much take care of them and feed them for about a month until they're ready to fledge. And due to Atlantic puffins having high nest fidelity, high nest site fidelity, meaning they're likely to return where they were born um, to nest. Uh, since they were raised on these islands in the Gulf of Maine uh, with a lot of effort and a lot of chicks translocated, um, within a decade, uh, they started breeding on these islands again. So that's how Project Puffin started. Um, it extended and um, became more broad with all seabirds. So they were trying to bring turns back. Um, they did this through uh, broadcasting uh, courtship um, playback and decoys. So these um, sea, these seabirds, they're colonial nesters. So if they see a lot of decoys and um, they hear a lot of courtship uh, playback going on, uh, they're more likely to check that site out and nest there. So, um, so like I said, Project Puffin kind of evolved into uh, a new thing called the Audubon Seabird Restoration Program, and they actively work to benefit rare and endangered seabirds worldwide, providing restoration methods and promoting seabird conservation and appreciation. So they've gone international. Uh, they've helped uh, Chinese crested terns, very endangered bird in China. Uh, they've done um, work in Jap Japan and also the Galapagos. So they're doing great work. And now we're just gonna dive deeper into Project Puffin and who they oversee. So we have seven islands, uh, those top right islands in the north, Eastern Egg, Seal Island, and Matinicus Rock. Those are all Puffin Islands. Um, they also have turns there. So um, they, they kind of have their own thing going on there. But the island I was on was Stratton Island. So those last four islands there on the south, they're all strictly turn islands. So Pond, Jenny, Outer Green, and Stratton are all turn islands. And what's good about being the southernmost island for this project is we happen to be on the southernmost range of a few breeding birds and the northernmost range of a few breeding birds. So we have a good diversity there. So now we'll look at Stratton Island. So this is the island I was um, sent to, and it is the centerpiece of Phineas W. Sprague Memorial Sanctuary. So it's a 21 acre island, just two miles off the coast of Maine. And um, you can see all these different colored zones. Um, they, these are different habitats that the breeding birds utilize. So it offers a variety of nesting habitat for breeding birds. So in that yellow area, you have where we set up camp and also a an interior deciduous forest. We have tree swallows, yellow warblers breeding in that area. Um, the large pond, that's where we have most of our waterfowl. So we're lucky enough to have um, this, this pond that um, collects rainwater and uh, the waterfowl utilize it to um, breed there. Um, we also have a mature apple orchard. So that's zone one, two, and three up there in the green. So this, this island actually used to be a farming island where they um, 
grew a bunch of apple trees and also raised cattle. So now that that's abandoned, um, we have this um, very mature apple orchard that the wading birds actually used um, to have a rookery there. So we have breeding wading birds there as well. And then of course, the main reason we're there is to research and monitor the turns and they utilize that one to 11 zone on the southern um, strip there of beach. And it's kind of like a rocky shoreline. Um, close to that one zone is a sandy, a sandy beach. And that's where we land. All right, so we'll talk about the breeding birds now. Um, the wading birds, we'll start with them. Uh, this year, actually, we, we had to do a wading bird census. They conduct those every two years. So I was lucky enough to be a part of that. Um, what that means is we uh, find some time to go into the rookery. Uh, we don't want to be there too long because all the, all the adults will flush and leaving the eggs exposed. So we limit our time to two hours at a time until we're able to uh, survey the whole area. And what we're looking for is these wading bird nests. So we need to be able to identify the species just by looking at the eggs in the nest. So the majority of the birds there were glossy ibis. Um, you can see the real deep blue eggs in that center top photo and the, the bottom right photo. Those deep blue eggs lined and with the nest lined with uh, dried reeds and dried leaves. That's typical of glossy ibis. Um, next, we had snowy egrets. Snowy egrets would be using very thin twigs and they have very pale blue eggs. So that would be that bottom middle picture. And uh, little blue herons actually look very similar to that. So it's very hard to tell the difference between them, but we only have a handful of little blues. Uh, the majority are snowies. And um, of course the great egrets, a big bird, uh, they use these big platform uh, nests. So there on that left, left picture, you can see us using a mirror pole, stretching it way up there into the apple tree to uh, see how many eggs are in that nest. Um, we also have black crown night herons nesting in the rookery and they're few and sparse, but they're state threatened. So it's good to have them there. All right, moving on to other breeding birds, we have shorebirds and waterfowl. So the two shorebirds we have breeding on the island are spotted sandpiper and American oyster catcher. Uh, spotted sandpipers, cute little sandpiper there. That bottom right photo is, uh, is a chick, just a few days old, already very mobile. And um, their nest looks like that bottom left photo. So they kind of look for an area with some vegetation, with uh, some cover and buy some water. And you can see that iconic like four eggs pointed towards the middle. So that's a diagnostic for spotted sandpiper. You'll come across those just uh, doing morning survey or anything. We don't closely monitor, to monitor them, but we do a uh, note whenever we find a nest. Um, and then American oyster catcher, that's one of those birds that I mentioned is the northernmost range. Um, they nest all along the Atlantic coast. Uh, we're lucky enough to be right there on the top of their breeding range. And they will have like a nest like that top right photo. They All they really need is a rocky shore and some loose pebbles to make a scrape and have those real camouflaged eggs. Um, so moving on to the waterfowl, uh, like I said, that pond, um, they use um, the pond to breed. And uh, so we'll have the Canada geese, the mallard, gadwall, blue winged teal, green winged teal, northern shoveler. And um, luckily we have these sea, sea ducks, common eiders. Uh, they utilize the whole island. Um, they All they really need is uh, some really shaded area and uh, they set up kind of like a down feather nest, very covered, and they'll incubate for extended periods of time. So it's, it's good to have that shade for them. So that they look for those shady areas. Um, so another thing we were lucky enough to be able to do this year was uh, it was common eider census year. So that's every four years. Uh, what we wanna do is cover the whole island, all 21 acres and count as many common eider nests that we can find. So that's, it's a pretty hard task because there is some very dense vegetation. So you find yourself crawling around a lot. And what's kind of gross about the common eider is whenever they flush out of their nest, if you happen to flush one, you really try to avoid flushing them. If you notice a female, you just note that there's a nest there and she's incubating. 
But if you do come across a, a female, they're, they're all brown, so they're very camouflaged, and she flushes right in front of you, she's most likely going to release this musk all over her eggs. And it's a very nasty smell, and it's just real gross. So, um, so that's something we had to deal with. Uh, but for the most part, you can kind of see a female on her nest. You avoid her, walk around her, and continue the census. All right, now we'll talk about the superstars of the island. It's the seabirds. So the common tern, the most abundant breeder on the island, uh, they're the sterna tern that have um, a very orange bill with a dark tip at the end of it. They have these dark wings that don't um, extend, or they extend far well beyond their tail. So the tail does not extend past the, the wing. Um, and they also have those, those orange legs. Um, we counted around uh, 1,300 of those nests. So we had 1,300 breeding pairs of common tern on the island. Um, and then moving on to roseate terns, we have the federally listed roseate tern. They are um, a tern with an all dark bill. You can see that long, sharp, dark bill. And they have very bright legs. And you can see that tail extends well beyond the, uh, the light wings that they have. So they don't have those dark wings and they have that long forked tail. Um, and they have this nasally call that you'll hear within the colony. So you'll be hearing all these common terns and then you'll, you'll pick out the, the rosy ter roseate terns. So common terns, they'll nest uh, pretty much anywhere. Um, like I said, 1,300 nests, they don't, can't really be picky. Um, they just need kind of like a little scrape. They'll fix it up as much as they'd like and um, settle for that. Roseate terns are a bit more specific. They'll, uh, they'll go for these uh, rock burrows. So what we do before the terns get there, we get there early in the season and we set up this kind of this artificial rock. We use natural rock, but um, it is artificial because we kind of set it up to what they prefer and what they like. So since they're federally listed, we really want as many roseate terns as possible to come breed on our island. Gives them a good shot at, at fledging young and it's really good habitat. All right, moving on. So Arctic tern, that's one of those turn, that's one of those birds that I mentioned is on their southernmost range. So we're right there on their southernmost range. And because of that, we don't have many Arctic terns, but um, you, you gotta be able to pick them out wherever they're sprinkled along the colony. So due to competition and not being in high numbers, they're gonna go ahead and nest on the outer edges of the colony. So if you have like a portable blind, you'll kind of sit in a portable blind and scan the edges of the colony and see if you can spot any uh, Arctic terns. They're gonna have that really ruby red uh, bill and those short little stubby ruby red uh, legs. And they have a tail that extends a little bit past their, their wings, but um, you can see they're very light colored. And then our tiniest little cutest tern is our least terns. The, they nest on sandy beach. So like I mentioned before, we are right by landing, we have that sandy beach that uh, we're lucky enough to have least terns. We're the only um, island in, on the project that has least terns. Uh, we had about 70 um, breeding pairs this season. They have that yellow bill, that white forehead, diagnostic white forehead, and just their size um, tells you you're probably looking at a least turn. All right, now, since you know the adults, we'll move on to the chicks. So this is what the chicks look like. Uh, the top left, you'll see the Arctic turn. They have that really dark face. Um, they'll be on the outer edge again. So they pretty much just need some, a little scrape. Their eggs are, have a bluish tint to them. So if you're walking along the edge of the colony, you notice an, a nest maybe with some bluish tint to it. It's probably a good, good idea to mark that and then kind of do recon later. Um, a really cool photo there on the bottom is a common turn uh, nest. So that's a three egg nest. At the top there, you have a one day old chick. So they develop pretty fast. That bottom chick that looks all wet that's just a few hours old that probably hatched you know earlier that day and you can actually see a little bit of that eggshell st still there that the adult hasn't disposed and then the egg there on the left um, if you look closely uh, I'm not sure if you can see it but it's starring so meaning um, that that chick inside is just about ready to hatch and it 
it wants to break through that eggshell. So if you look at all these chicks here, you'll notice a little white tip on their bill. That's called an egg tooth. It's just a little calcium buildup that they develop in the egg um, and it helps them break through the shell. So um, the roseate turn there on the bottom, uh, they have that uh, hedgehog look to them. So they have these spiky feathers. Um, they have these dark legs as well that you can't see right there, but you'll see later on. Um, so they're, they're pretty easy to ID because of that, that hedgehog look. And also they'll be probably in burrows or, or these rock caves. Um, so you'll be kind of digging for them. Uh, and then luckily enough, we don't have puffins on our island, but we do have another alcid. Um, it is a black guillemot. So they um, have a few historic burrows on the island. So we're always on a lookout. We don't really closely monitor them, but whenever we have a chance, we just check up on them. Um, there you can see just a few days old black guillemot chick. They're just all black. And um, eventually they'll develop this white patch on their wing. All right, now we'll talk briefly about the predators. So, um, so Dr. Stephen Kress had this, uh, he really stressed that he wanted to restore these birds, but he wanted to restore them back into the ecosystem. So these terns, they're not at the top of the food chain. So you need to be able to um, accept uh, certain predators, right? Um, you do your fair bit of predator control, such as like the great blackback gulls. If we do find a nest um, too close to the colony, we will uh, remove that nest in hopes that the, the parent will then look for a different area to, to nest in. Um, but a peregrine falcon, for example, that's a supplement hunter. So that, that bird's gonna come by, it's gonna probably knock out an adult, take it, you know, the, the, the colony does a pretty good job at, at deterring the, uh, the peregrine falcons. So they'll gang up on the falcon and chase it off, but um, it's a supplement hunter. So it's gonna take what it, it needs to eat and, and move on. Um, we, we did have the peregrine come by every few days, uh, but that's just, that's just natural. Um, the black crown night herons, they can be a big problem on uh, the sandy beach where our least turns nest. Um, they will just completely like wipe out a whole colony if given the chance. So if ever we suspect uh, an individual that is out for blood, we'll make sure we uh, maybe do a night stint to uh, deter it or, or kind of lo locate the issue if there is an issue. All right, now we'll move on to the research and monitoring side. So this is the bulk of it. Um, so what it, the goal of the project is to assess breeding productivity through chick, chick growth and survival. So what that means is um, every season, we collect all this data to be able to put it into a huge database and just see if the, the colony is doing better, worse, or, or any, anything is going on that we could be able to pick out and, and make some adjustments. So how we do that is instead of, you know, being overwhelmed and trying to band every chick in the colony, we pick certain plots and we set up chicken wire around a certain set of nests. And those are the ones we're going to follow. And that'll give us a snapshot of how the colony is doing as a whole. So in total, we have six um, productivity plots. This chicken wire fence um, keeps the chicks from, you know, running off when they become mobile too far from their nests and um, us being unable to follow them. So we'll, we'll have that productivity plot set up. Um, we'll ban the chick once it's hatched. Then we'll also measure its wing cord and its weight. Those two things, wing cord and weight, give you an idea of how healthy that chick is doing. So if you have two chicks, they both have the same wing cord, but one weighs more, you know that chick is being uh, well-fed and the other one maybe is not doing as well. And then um, we do this uh, every other day. So we wanna minimize disturbance, of course, but we also want to collect our data. So every other day we go into these plots and we, once the chicks start becoming mobile, we wrangle them up, we put them in that cardboard box you see up there on the top right photo. Uh, they all have their bands already, so we'll know which nest they belong to. We bring them down to the shore, uh, away from the colony for a bit, just to reduce disturbance, and we'll uh, process them down there, bring them back up, put them in their respective nests, in their respective areas, 
and they're usually good. Um, right there in that bottom left photo, you can see um, once the turns are done dive bombing you and pooping all over you, that's their two defense mechanisms, they dive and poop, um, they'll eventually get curious enough to just land on your shoulder and check out what you're doing with their chick. And we'll do this, uh, these uh, checkups until these uh, chicks are ready to fledge. So a really fun day on the island was when we saw our first chick fly right out of the productivity plot and you just know, okay, we're not catching that chick, that chick has officially fledged. So we'll follow them until they fledge or of course, until we find them dead or missing. All right, and now for the roseate side of things, since they are federally, federally listed, uh, we put a little more effort into monitoring the roseate turn chicks. Um, so what we do is we mark every confirmed roseate turn nest. Um, we do that uh, by putting a pink flag um, where we see two adults um, incubating. And we try to do that as early as possible so that we can band the chick once it hatches on hatch day. So what's cool about these chicks is they develop so much within the egg is the day they hatch. You just need, they need a few hours and you're ready to put a, both bands on. You can put that metal band and also that plastic field readable. So that plastic field readable um, is even more um, conservation effort into uh, knowing what their stopover habitat is, where they're wintering. Um, it's, it's the easiest way to recite a bird. So um, all along the Atlantic coast, especially Cape Cod, there's these huge stopover habitats for when these chicks fledge, they go make their way, they start their migration and in hopes of, you know, someone reciting them or of course, next season, if they show up, we know that they survived their whole migration. They, they wintered in their wintering grounds and then made their second migration up north back to a breeding ground. All right, so um, that was working in the colony. Now we talk about more passive things where you um, just observe the colony. We do that within a bird blind right there in that photo. You can see we, we build those at the, build, at the beginning of the season. They're a four-sided um, wooden blind that we put some curtains up once you're inside and we spend uh, about three hours a day in a blind stint. Uh, there's a bucket in there with a with a little cushion that you sit on, and the goal is to um, closely monitor the colony and collect data with minimal disturbance. So it's kind of like an out of sight, out of mind thing. They first get all rowdy when they see you approaching the colony, and once you get inside that blind, um, just maybe a few minutes, they'll all settle down and go back to tending to their chicks. All right, so what exactly are we doing inside of those blinds? Um, one big thing is conducting feeding studies to assess diet and feeding rate. So what exactly we're looking at is we wanna know what food source these birds are using to feed their chicks. So the way we do that is um, we observe. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pick, we're gonna pick a certain amount of nests within a good view of the blind and we're gonna mark them. So let's say we have seven nests. Um, we wanna make sure that that nest has a fair amount of chicks. So maybe um, a few two egg nests, a one egg nest, three egg nests. We want variability there. Um, variability is great for research. Um, and so let's say we have a three egg nest. Now we know, okay, so the, the, the first chick hatched, that's now an A chick. What we're gonna do to that A chick is we're gonna get a colored marker and we're gonna mark it right on its crown. So that, that um, makes it an A chick. The second chick to hatch is a B chick. We're gonna mark that chick with a colored marker of the same color on its back. And then if there is a C chick, uh, we'll mark that one on its belly. Um, C chicks are not likely to fledge. Uh, B chicks are kind of like an insurance policy and the HX are really what the parents are focused on. So that so the HX first to hatch, C chick last to hatch. Um, so once those chicks are marked, now you know which chicks are are present. Um, now you want to be able to choose a nest that has a banded adult and an unbanded adult. So this project has been going on for a long time, and we have these turns returning, but they don't always um, have pick a mate that has a band or doesn't have a band. 
Um, so the, the best possible way to differentiate the adults is to pick a nest that has an adult with a band and an adult that is unbanded so that you'll be able to differentiate. Um, that, that's the perfect scenario. It doesn't always happen that way, but um, we try our best. And so now I'll walk you through a feeding, one feeding. So an adult comes and starts circling. You see food in its mouth and, or you see food in its bill and you see, you know, nest four, the two chicks perk up and you know, okay, that's, they, they, they know their parents voice. That's most likely going to come down to nest four. So that adult circling, you notice, you know, a, a fish in its bill. Okay. You're like, okay, so I know it's a fish. The, the bird starts coming down it lands and you have a quick few seconds to gather all this data. What you wanna gather is the prey species. So you wanna be able to identify that foraging fish. Um, this was the overwhelming part for me. Um, I did not know how to ID fish. So that was, there was a huge learning curve there. But once you get a hang of it, um, you tend to get the same fish over and over again with a few, with some variability. But for the most part, you get sand lance, herring, hake. Uh, anyways, so, the, the adult lands, um, let's say, for example, it's that roseate turn there on the right side photo, uh, that, that fish is actually a sand lance. So it's a long skinny fish with a pointed snout. So we know it's a sand lance. So now we need to get the size. The way we estimate size is Coleman length. So right there on the left side photo, you can see the length of, a, of the Coleman of the bird that's from the base of the nostril to the tip of the bill. So that, so what you need to do is be able to visualize that droopy fish and you straighten it out and you need to turn it parallel to the bill and you need to be able to tell yourself okay how far does it extend past the coleman how far in relation to the coleman so you would estimate that maybe at a 1.5 or 1.75 so you you get a hang of like what one looks like and what 0.5 looks like it's all takes practice but once you got those two things down then you really want to know which chick is being fed so you see that a chick He's a bit of a bully. He's got that marked crown and he snags the fish from the adult. So now you note, you mark that down that the A chick was fed a sand lance of 1.5 length. Um, you quickly look at your watch. You see that the adult landed at you know, 8.30 in the morning. Um, the, that adult kind of sits around while the chicks scream at it and beg and it kind of just makes sure it's, it's chicks are doing okay. Everything's right. There's no um, surrounding uh, adults bullying their chicks, and then it goes off and, and looks for more uh, fish to feed its, its chicks. So then you, you write down that departure time. During that time, if you were able to see if that, that adult was banded or not, you know, okay, that was the banded one, or that was the unbanded one. And that's one complete feeding study. That can happen within seconds. And then another one comes in a few seconds later. So that can be definitely overwhelming, but some days it can be slow. And Typically in the beginning of the season, it's a little slower and you'll be able to pick it up. But it, once those chicks start getting in that, like that teenager phase where they're just hungry, 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 it's pretty crazy. You can have four adults coming in. The, the least amount of data you wanna get is which chick was fed and um, from which nest. All right, so moving on um, to a more slow paced, um, um, activity within the blind is just reciting banded breeding adults and fledglings. So early on in the season, we get in the blinds and we see which um, roseate terns have returned from their wintering grounds and we see which ones are checking out a potential nest site or, an, or a little burrow. We're typically um, focusing on roseate terns because they're just so much easier to um, recite with that plastic field readable. It's the three, three digit code. Um, if you have a very cooperative common turn and Arctic turn that just have that metal band, which is a, a federally, um, it's a federal band, it's a bird banding lab, um, it's kind of like a social security number. If you're able to get that number, um, then lucky you, but uh, the main focus is those roseate turns. Um, and if you need a better view from uh, the blinds, you can always use one of those portable blinds there on the left side. Oh, and I did want to mention, so at the end of the season, it's pretty exciting when um, 
you start seeing the fledglings um, out on the rocky shores that have officially fledged and they're ready to start their migration. So um, it was really rewarding to see uh, some of the roseate turn chicks that I banded and put field readables on, seeing them by the shore, um, almost ready to make their way down south. So that's another effort we put in towards the end of the season. Okay, now we'll talk about island life. So that was all the work part. Now we'll dive a little deeper into what it's like living there. So we don't really go to the mainland. We're stuck on this island. It's pretty rustic conditions. So what we do have there is a permanent three-sided kitchen shelter. Um, you can see that on the left side picture, uh, it's that wooden uh, structure there. Uh, you can see just the mass amount of supplies that we brought. That was the first trip. Um, just everything needs to be put onto a boat. The boat needs to be taken to the island. Then we get onto an inflatable boat. You put the stuff onto the inflatable boat, you row that into the island, and then you haul all the stuff from shore to the research tent area. So you really want to pack, um, you don't want to pack these big bags that'll just be hard to carry. Um, smaller is better. Uh, and so, yeah, the research tent there, that, that white tent, uh, we had to build that. That's just usually a wooden platform. Um, it's just a bunch of metal poles and, and this weatherproof canvas tent. And that's where all of our data is stored and our computers and um, any kind of cameras and uh, resources that we need to make sure we keep safe. Um, we do get resupplied every three to four weeks for food, uh, water. Stratton Island is actually lucky enough to have its own boat. So we can go um, to the docks on the mainland to fill up with our water. Um, so that's not a big issue. But food, um, we have to make sure we get enough food for those three to four weeks. Because logistically, it's just tough to um, resupply all these islands. The, the project has the seven islands. Um, everyone's on a, on a strict schedule. And then, of course, um, we're tent camping there. So we set up our tents uh, for the duration of the season. Um, that's, that was a little difficult for me. I've never done a field job where I'm really in the field. Uh, so I had definitely had to get used to that. You eventually get this layer of dirt that you're comfortable with and you just accept it. So right there, that middle symbol, um, no showers. Uh, so no traditional showers because we don't have running water, but you can, you know, jump in the ocean, can use a little rainwater, fresh water to rinse off. Um, you find out what you need to stay mentally uh, healthy and happy. Um, and then we use a outhouse. So we have a compost outhouse. All right, so now we're moving on to a little more serious note is, so through all this research and monitoring, what is the current status of the seabirds in the Gulf of Maine? So this year was a particularly bad year. Um, it was a very wet year. Uh, everyone kept telling me about what a wet year was. It was my first season there. so. I wasn't too sure what to expect. Um, it was a very wet year and the birds did not do great. Um, there was definitely food shortage and uh, food availability was low. But, um, but yeah, so that was my experience. Um, so overall, the bigger picture, we're seeing a shift of mostly good years with a few bad years to mostly bad years with a few good years sprinkled there in between. Um, so when we think about this, uh, why, why is this happening? Why, why are we not having a lot of good years and just a few bad years because of, you know, weather or, or whatever? Um, why are we having just a bunch of bad years? And then, you know, luckily we have, we pull a good year every once in a while. Um, as big over all encompassing answer, climate change. So we all know climate change has its fair share of I try to keep the, the door sh of the car shut as much as possible. I think they're letting yep. me out. Or... You're, uh... Oops. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so climate change. Um, so what does that mean? How does climate change affect these uh, breeding, these seabird colonies in the Gulf of Maine? So foraging fish are moving farther out into cooler waters. So the temperatures are rising in the, in the Gulf of Maine. What these foraging fish are doing is they're saying, 
but let's we need to move out to further out to cooler waters. And what that means is the islands aren't moving, the fish are. Now this little range that the, uh, the this proximity that the seabirds have to go out look for food and come back to their to their young um, without spending too much time looking for food is being lengthened to they either go really far out and look for desirable fish or they resort to less desirable prey items and in turn they're going to feed less frequently they're not just going to go for that less desirable fish immediately they're always going to try to figure figure out if they can find you know those sand lance those herring those hake those the herring fishery um fish uh, but what's what was happening this year and previous years any bad year is going to have this is they're bringing in a lot of butterfish. So on that right side picture, you can see a butterfish. That's a very wide bodied fish. So what the, these turn chicks are typically used to is swallowing these long skinny foraging fish that can go down just with a few gulps. Uh, they swallow it whole. So when they try to swallow this butterfish that the adult brings in, it just gets stuck on their gape. Like they just cannot get it down. They put a lot of effort into trying to get that fish down with no reward. So they end up dropping the fish or they, they, they end up, the adult ends up taking the fish because the, 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 the chick is just rejecting it. Um, it's just a lot of energy being put into trying to t uh, tend to their young with uh, no, no reward, right? They're, they're not going to develop. They're not going to be healthy. Um, it's just a, a huge loss of energy and turns, they can barely hand, handle um, taking care of two chicks. Like I said, the B is an insurance policy. If they're putting so much effort into trying to feed that A chick, there's just no chance that B chick is even going to have a chance at surviving. Um, so that's the foraging fish side of it, the food source. Then we have climate change producing storms that are becoming um, much more frequent and more intense in the Gulf of Maine. So this summer we actually had Hurricane Elsa come through and it was at probably the worst time possible that that storm could have come through because what we have is these terns are breeding. When the chicks hatch, they're still being incubated and brooded by their parents. They can fit under their, their parents during a storm. They're, they're not likely to succumb to exposure. Um, as they get older, if they're old enough, they can, maybe that chick right there is, is you know, a few weeks old. That, that bird could probably handle a storm being right there next to their parent. They can't fit under their parent, so they'll, they'll just kind of hunker down next to their parent and weather through the storm. So what Hurricane Elsa, the timing for Hurricane Elsa was, it was that in-between stage where the chick wasn't big enough to weather through the storm, and it wasn't small enough to fit under its parent. So we had a huge die off um, after Hurricane Elsa and just a few storms after that as well, that uh, these all these chicks succumbing to exposure. Just they're, they're not being fed well and they can barely survive a storm. So with all that said, like we got to think about what we can do, right? So on a project scale, um, we are going to continue researching and monitoring and in turn, hopefully that creates some good evidence that they're, these birds are struggling and that there should be stronger regulations and management within the herring fisheries. So that's something the project can do and aim towards um, um, getting handled. And then on a more individual level, you can support the seabird conservation, help raise awareness. Um, you can follow us on social media. That's how you can help raise awareness and spreading the word your friends and family. Uh, you can always visit projectpuffin.audubon.org where we have a few programs. We have an adopt a puffin program where um, you can donate a certain amount of money and you get a certificate of adoption and a little biography of your puffin. And you also get a book, the book um, written by uh, Stephen, Dr. Stephen Kress. So of how, how he brought the puffins back to the island. So that's always an option. You can always just donate it as well. If you believe in the project and you believe we're doing good work, you can always donate to the project. And if you are um, someone within this career field, uh, you can always get involved. Or if you're just a volunteer, you want to be a volunteer, um, there's plenty of volunteer opportunities. 
um, just visit that website and you can see how you can get involved. Um, and then also on an individual level, since we touched on climate change and how that's such a big issue, always work on reducing your carbon footprint. And um, so that's pretty much the whole presentation. Thank you for tuning in. And now it's your turn. Had to throw in a little pun there, turn. Um, any, does anyone have any questions? Actually, we did have a question from Anne. She asked, what is the typical time frame from the chick hatching to the chick fledging? Okay, yeah. So when the chick hatches, um, we can think of it as like maybe, I think if I recall, give me one second. Cause there was, there was, I think it was 28 days where you can officially call the chick fledged or 20, 21 to 28 days. You can call it, officially call it chick fledged. But the problem this year is they were pretty underdeveloped. So they weren't fledging at that, at that day mark. So, um, so we, we had to keep on monitoring those, those chicks to um, see how they would, um, how they would pull through, whether they would fledge or, um, you know, succumb to exposure or starve. So it, it, on these bad years, it, it's a little iffy, but typically uh, three to four weeks, a chick can fledge. All right, I think that's the only question we had, but people, um, yeah, actually we had a lot of comments and saying it's in a good year, that's pretty quick. And Lauren was saying she loved the beautiful picture of the turn with the fully outstretched wings. So, and great presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. This was just outstanding and really yeah. drives home things we can so do. I have, a, I have one question. Did okay. you have to, when the hurricane came, did you guys evacuate or? Uh, well, <laughs> so I guess I shouldn't have used the word hurricane because it kind of decimated it as, as it. Yeah. came through uh so we just we just weathered through it um we have you know that research tent and it's pretty secure we we just hunkered down just like the turns did and it was fine we we had a you know a few inches of rain but uh but yeah it was it was fine okay yeah very good so brian you're currently at the um keys hawk watch correct yeah, Instead. so now, now I'm helping, um, I'm a counter for the Florida Keys Hawk Watch. Uh, we're the Peregrine Falcon Migration Capital of the World. So last week or last weekend, counted hundreds of peregrines moving through. Um, the other two counters were here early September, uh, counting swallowtail kites, August and September, counting swallowtail kites, they migrate earlier. So they were getting huge numbers, um, a lot of un unanswered questions and a lot of new questions uh, coming from, from that, that data that, that was collected, so. Great.